everyone. Happy Monday. Thank you so much for joining us. Up to 80% women will experience period of pain in, her, in their lifetime, and with up to 15% experiencing severe symptoms for long periods of time. And when non-surgical treatments like hormone therapy or pain relief medications don't provide enough relief, doctors may actually recommend a hysterectomy. A hysterectomy is a surgical procedure that removes the uterus. Um, it's usually considered as a last resort for treating period pain because it's a major surgery and it makes um, impossible for a woman to become pregnant after that. While hysterectomies uh, may be considered a last resort, about 600,000 hysterectomies are performed each year. Uh, while getting a hysterectomy could be beneficial, for helping with period pain, it might not be the only solution. And that's why we're really glad to be chatting with um, Dr. Uh, Salome uh, Mascati. Dr. Mascati um, is a fellowship trained gynecologic surgeon and a functional medicine uh, physician whose main areas of interest are pelvic pain, sexual health, endometriosis, fibroids, um, of vulvodynia and hormone health. So during this live, uh, we're going to discuss myth about hysterectomies uh, for period pain, how to deal with pain post hysterectomy and other ways of, to deal with uh, period pain that doesn't involve a hysterectomy. So I'm going to let her know that we are live so she could join us. Thank you for waiting for me. <laughs> no, no problem. Thank you so much for taking the time. And this is a really, really important topic. And then so many people are experiencing it. So I'm so glad that you're you're taking the time to chat with us. I love what you're doing. I love that you created this company. I'm super excited to learn about it through you. So I'm excited about this chat as well. Thank you. So before we start, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you became a gynecologist. Yeah, um, I always loved women's health. When I was 17 years old in high school, I wrote a dissertation about menopause. Um, I loved hormones. I loved women's health. Um, and yeah, so when I went through med school, it was pretty clear I was going to do GYN. It was a really great combination of surgery, but also clinic and office and prevention and doing women's health. And I was always very interested in that. And then my um, aunt had a breast cancer, so I was always interested in cancer prevention. And then when I uh, finished a residency and fellowship in surgery, minimally invasive surgery, I also discovered functional medicine. So I brought that to the table as well. And that's now to me, like it's the complete picture. I can help women on so many levels. And yeah, so it's super exciting. And I keep learning. I keep learning every day. Well, but you, you credit the Ballers Protocol Institute for having, you know, a big hand in your training, like, you know, for are they like, why do you feel the yeah. Sure. Um, so, you know, with functional medicine training, it's not standardized like residency where, you know, we go through a training. So with balance protocol, it was my functional medicine training was through Dr. Anthony G. Beck, and he's a naturopathic physician and he created this. And what I loved about his training, it was different than IFM or AFRM. It wasn't focused just saying, this is one system. It all starts in the gut. No, it all starts everywhere. And you want to have to look at the system-based uh, approach. And I love that. So we kind of look at nutrients, minerals, vitamins, but also the gut and also the hormone system. So you look at everything and you look at it, uh, there is um, just, it's all very individualized. And I thought it was great. And then after I completed that, I worked in a mold and line clinic as well in an anti-aging clinic. So I learned so much beyond that, you know, so it's just everywhere I go, everything I do is just in constant learning. And then currently I do offer also virtual consults for Moment Health and they are a company, um, a startup based on hormones only. So we kind of help women uh, virtually as well. So there's a lot of things that can be done. Mm -hmm. That is so cool. So today we're talking about hysterectomies and then period pain. Like, so I gave like a sort of a high level explanation what, uh, of a hysterectomy. Um, do you mind going to a little more detail? Like a, what is this procedure? Yeah. Sure, sure, sure. When you do a hysterectomy, you remove the uterus. The word hysterect, a hystero or hysteru, comes from the Greek, um, and that's where, um, you know, hysteria, when we say the mon woman was hysteria, it comes from the belief that all w female emotions are um, 
basically located in a woman's uterus, in her womb. And a hysterectomy means the removal of that womb. And when we do a hysterectomy, usually we remove the uterine body, the uterine cervix, which is the canal and the opening to the uterus, and the fallopian tubes. Nowadays, we always remove the fallopian tubes because it decreases the risk of ovarian cancer for one type of ovarian cancer. If someone also gets the ovaries removed, that's called oophorectomy. But usually when we do a hysterectomy, we remove the uterus uh, from its attachments in the body. And, and we're able to do this for most women in a minimally invasive approach so we don't have to make a big cut. So why would a, a person get a hysterectomy for period pain? Yeah, so I would say the way I approach it, it's like last resort. If someone's fibroids are so big that really they're not going to respond to any conservative management, functional medicine approach, nutrition approach, um, if their bleeding does not respond to any type of um, a balancing of hormones, balancing of nutrient levels, just the, those severe cases that are refractory to anything else, if someone's endometriosis is so advanced that the pain is not controlled despite any type of conservative management. Those might be issues for someone to undergo um, a hysterectomy. Unfortunately, the reality is, in practice, a lot of women undergo hysterectomy without having explored all uh, options. First. That's really unfortunate because it's like irreversible. Yes. And, and um, it is absolutely irreversible. And it's, a, it's an organ that is attached to you and that you're missing. And there's, there's a lot of women who actually experience some complications from that you know someone who is severely sick and who has tried everything and for them it's just i'm not going to try to 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 just shed a negative light on that it can be saving life-saving for some women but what i'm saying is if you're doing it before you've explored other options a lot of women think that was a rush decision they're not dead it's it's like with anything you want that to be a progression of everything else at the end of it if that's the last resort then you do surgery but cutting out an organ out of the woman and i'm a surgeon saying that it's not, a, it's, it's not to be taken lightly. And, uh, so, and the womb, I mean, it has such a big role in our, in our, in our, um, life. I mean, that's where a baby grows. That's where our period comes from. It has a purification, um, um, uh, uh, role where, you know, with the menstrual period each month, you kind of purify the body. It's a detoxification organ. So, so you, you are removing something that's, it's a, it's, it's a part of a woman's body. Yeah. Is it possible that someone can still experience uh, pure, uh, pain in their bodies after the hysterectomy? If so, you know, what's the reason for this? Phantom pain where mm. something is removed, it could be a limb, it could be an organ system, and you still feel it has to do with the nerve endings. Um, with the uterus, for example, there's nerves from the vagus nerve, uh, there's nerve endings going to the cervix. So if you cut that stump off, if you cut the cervix off, they might have actually residual pain from those nerve endings being cut at the vaginal cuff. There's also um, instances where someone, for example, if they had endometriosis, and even though the uterus is gone, they still have endometriotic lesions. So they still could have uh, pain that resembles period pain, but the uterus is gone. Uh, so it all depends on the picture, but yes, to answer your question, it is possible. Uh, what impact could like a hysterectomy have on your hormones like you know what should you do to help kind of bring the balance back after the procedure i, I always say that like if you don't address the hormonal imbalance before the surgery you're still going to deal with that after let's say you have estrogen excess i don't like the word dominance but um and i have yeah i have other physicians who have said the same thing it's it's not so much dominance but it's an imbalance between estrogen and progesterone and other hormones well if you have that imbalance and you remove the uterus Yes, she, she stops bleeding, but then you still have other organ systems affected by estrogen, right? Like, for example, the breast is a great example of that. And so it, she still has like fibrocystic breasts or, you know, breast tenderness and mood issues. So you, you have to balance the hormones. Um, and, and you can still do that after hysterectomy. Let's say someone had a hysterectomy and comes to me and says, Dr. Biscotti, I didn't know about you before, but now I have had a hysterectomy. I want to balance my hormones now. It's not too late, but what I'm saying is the underlying cause is not being treated with the hysterectomy. And then, um, you know, you just have to understand when you go undergo surgery that there's always possible side uh, uh, yeah. risks and, and complications. And as long as the patient understands that, you know. What are some like a common like underlying causes of, you know, period of pain? Because I would think that like, based on what you said, there must be like instances where a person is experiencing the pain, but they really should not be getting it. Yeah, 
I think and we chose this is a great example where it's a multifactorial thing. There can be something called central sensitization where your nerve endings get from different organ systems get very hypersensitive. So then you start having bowel issues, bladder problems, musculoskeletal problems, your pelvic floor. So it's not just the uterus, the cause. And so you remove the uterus, you still have pain. Um, that's a great example of that. Um, or you might have still inflammation, not just from the nerves being sensitized, but there's actually still inflammation outside of the uterus going on. So that's a great example. Um, another example would be, you know, if it wasn't uterine pain at all, like it was the ovarian vessels being engorged, we call it pelvic congestion. Or it could be something where they have pelvic floor tenderness from tightness from the pelvic floor. If you remove the uterus, they still have pain with intercourse or with defecation. Or uh, they could have something called interstitial cystitis and it wasn't the uterus. But you just did an ultrasound. The uterus showed something like fibroids and you assume it's that, but you never ruled out other causes. Now the patient has the uterus removed. They still have bladder symptoms. They still have pelvic floor symptoms. They still have inflammation. They still have gut leaky gut there's so many things like ibs so mm -hmm. there could be so many um overlapping things that's why i don't like looking at the body and say this is a this is this is what you have this is what i like to look at the body as a whole because you have to always understand everything and then um looking also at period issues you could have underlying thyroid problems mm -hmm. now it removes your uterus but you still have thyroid issues right so always thinking about where's the root cause of the issues the hysterectomy is is not there's the answer to everything. It's just one part of the puzzle for those who didn't respond to anything else. I think it's also super, super essential for people who are considering it to understand that there will be side effects. So, and it's a organ that, and it's irreversible. So before you make that decision, it's really, really important to explore all areas, making sure like you addressing this root cause before you make that decision. I think it's very hard because you go to your regular OBGYN and you're going to listen to whoever diagnoses you with whatever they see on the ultrasound. And you're going to, it's so difficult in life to find a specialist for everything and seek a hundred different opinions before you make a decision. It gives you too many choices. What I tell women is I'm here as a great second opinion for you because I'm a surgeon. I'm not just a naturopathic doctor or a chiropractor, a pharmacist who's never touched a uterus, who doesn't know what a surgeon is like. I actually do those surgeries. So I will be very frank with you if I think surgery is the best option for you. It's just that I can also help you through my functional medicine background to tell you what are your other band avenues that you can go first. And so it's, it's just seek me out as a second opinion. You can do it as a virtual consultation. It's really not really difficult. You upload all your labs and your images and we can do that in a half an hour, hour consult. But in general, like it's very hard when you go to the physician who suggests the surgery you would have to really go out of your way to go and find five different doctors yeah. five different opinions so that you and you have to really educate yourself nowadays now online you'll find a lot of very polarizing opinions yeah. you'll either have the surgeons or you will have the health coaches and the naturopathic doctors who are like always just poo-pooing the surgeons or the and the, <laughs> so it's very so hard as a, as a as a patient you know what can i trust so I like to say I like to bridge it because I know both worlds and and I think that there's limitations to either world. And so you have to figure out what's the right timing and what's the right approach for you sort of patient. So that's where the skills come in and the experience of having experienced both functional naturopathic approach and the surgical approach. Love it. Love it. Love it. <laughs> it's this whole integration is is truly amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It's rare. I don't know a lot of my colleagues that are interested in that who are the surgeons. And, and then obviously if you're on the other side, it's hard to get into the surgery unless, you know, you observed it or you experienced it yourself firsthand. So it's definitely something that I think, you know, where I stand apart, but then again, it's hard to put that word out because you, you have so many options and it can be very overwhelming and everybody has a different approach. So to me, it's and, and I work with people who come from other other naturopaths or physicians or functional and I work with them with that too. I don't, you know, I don't judge anybody with their different approaches. I just say, let's meet you where you are now and let's make the best of, of what you have now and what we can do for you. And the same goes, you know, for endometriosis or fibroids. Like there is a time, a place for surgery, but there's a lot of things we can do non surgically first. So absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what, what are the first steps you would recommend if a person experienced a chronic period pain? I think they would 
So I think it always the, the starts with um, working at your environment, looking at your, um, you know, making sure you're sleeping okay, making sure you're not uh, under certain types of stressors. There could be certain toxicities in your environment. This is where your testing comes in. You want to make sure you remove all types of endocrine disruptors, xenoestrogens, which are the molecules, the chemicals in your body that look like they stimulate estrogen receptors and they can cause heavy painful periods. You want to clean out your environment. You want to clean up your diet. You know, eating fast food, processed food, it might be convenient when we're super busy. We don't have time to cook. But, you know, cleaning up our diet really works. Uh, reducing alcohol, reducing just the obvious triggers, right? And then in addition to that, you can seek help from someone who understands, you know, fun functional approach to gynecology. So you can get a gut health testing. You can get um, the immunologic testing that I do for um, T cell immune response. You can do a nutritional evaluation because sometimes having magnesium deficiency, certain B vitamins that they can interact with um, the estrogen metabolism and it can cause more inflammation. It can cause heavier bleeding. So there's, there's a lot of that. You want to have someone who understands hormones as well when they do that because you want to check your thyroid. You want to check this estrogen imbalance. Um, so those would be where I would start is first cleaning up my environment, cleaning up my diet, make sure I'm sleeping okay. I'm getting moderate amounts of exercise, sunlight. I do the basics of health. If you still feel you're, you're, you're not getting anywhere, then you would, you would seek the help of, of, a, of a physician or professional, you know? Yeah. You, you almost answered my next question. So I was going to ask you, you know, what can we do nutrient-wise to offset some of the, the period pain? I'm a fan of measuring things, and it's not easy because it's not all just in the serum. Sometimes it's red blood cells, plasma, sometimes it's the urine. Ideally, if a patient is okay with spending a little bit more money, I can get um, really good evaluation of their nutrients. Uh, sometimes we can just work with insurance for certain testing. But if I get it first, then I can specialize. I mean, I can, um, you know, precisely tell a patient what they need. It's not a general approach. But if you want it, some recommendations, many people are magnesium deficient nowadays. It has to do with the depletion of minerals in our food. And magnesium is an anti-cramping nutrient, right? It relaxes the muscle. And the uterine uh, tissue, the muscle, that is part of what the cramping, the period pain is come from. You want to reduce inflammation, so anti-inflammatories, vitamin C, vitamin E, um, resveratrol, polyphenols, this kind of things. And you can do it through diet as well and supplement when needed. Zinc can be something that a lot of women are deficient in. Again, I love testing, though. I During COVID, I, I had a lot of women that were zinc overloaded and then had an imbalanced zinc copper ratio. So it doesn't apply to everybody, but on a general basis, you can't go wrong with magnesium. You can't go wrong with a wholesome diet that's full of folate, vitamin Bs in your diet, green leafy vegetables, cruciferous vegetables, and you can do some zinc. You can try some that. You can optimize your vitamin D levels. That's very important for inflammation. And you can do that in the summer for sunlight, in the winter for some vitamin D supplementation. Um, I would say those are the most important ones generalized. Now, obviously, if I can individualize and test people, then there can be even more depth to that what I said. We, we can obviously, we're like a huge proponent for testing because we always say that, you know, you know better, you do better. Yeah. And this is absolutely Correct. personalized to you that when you have your own data, then you can act on that data versus like just, okay, how do I know my vitamin D is low, right? Like, how do I know I, I really needed something? Yeah. So testing is uh, super, super important. It's super important. And some of them are just very easy, you know, to do. And so, yeah. So I think that answers that question. I know, but I, I really encourage everyone to, if you don't get better with those basics, to seek further and seek help where you can, we can get tested. Yeah. I think this is where you come in because with your wealth of knowledge, like people can really benefit uh, from the second opinion. Um, so what does the session with you look like? Um, I usually just get a really good history. I can't do a physical. I love doing exam in person especially in gynecology, a pelvic exam can give me so much information. I love it. And I'll never get tired of examining people because that's the part that I miss with virtual health. Mm -hmm. But at least virtually, I can ask certain questions. I can really get a good history. And then we look over, we can order some basic labs. And then if beyond that, we need more information, we can talk about some functional labs. I don't bombard someone with a program where right off the 
uh, you know, had to have to spend $5,000 to get anything done. No, we started very slow, very easy. We talk about the basics first, and then we individualize based on how much a patient can spend. It also depends on their individual environmental triggers. If I suspect, for example, mold, I'm going to do mold testing, but I don't do mold testing for everyone. I don't believe that we should do every test for every woman. We have to individualize the approach for women. And so, yeah, but the session starts with a good history and a review of whatever they have already done and then deciding what labs we need. That is amazing. How could people get in touch? I'm so bad with my <laughs> because I just, I'm so busy and I do, you know, many different things, but they can just write me on Instagram and then I usually um, email them back. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Amazing. Is there anything else you'd like to promote and share? I just wanted to say that I think your testing is fantastic. I've been thinking about it myself for years that we needed something like that. And the reason is because we know that we have higher um, occurrence of maybe we're better at diagnosing, but we have uh, fast growing fibroids, endometriosis, we have infertility. And I do believe that the forever chemicals and the plastics and the parabens and all these endocrine disruptors are a part of that puzzle. I believe there's other components too that. I don't want to get censored on Instagram, but there are other components to this too. But I do believe these chemicals are definitely a really important part. So I love that you that you created this company. I, I think you're fantastic. And um, yeah, it's definitely part of my workup is to check for toxins. I check for heavy metals, mold, uh, those endocrine disruptors um, as part of the workup for some women who have um, resistant uh, treatment uh, response. Yeah. Thank you for that. We we totally believe in testing, and then we wanted more people to actually understand like the impact of these environmental toxins. And then testing is the first step, like you know, just not just for individual, but also like societal wise, because we don't even have the data to actually push for safer, you know, products and then environmental policy. So that's one area besides you know education that we're working on. We're hoping to contribute to really. Like eventually we hope like we don't need this, you know, like people don't have to worry about these toxins yeah. you know, in, a, in an environment. And I always talk to my patients about how to clean up their environment, how to filter the water, air filter, all of this part of it. But I think beyond that, we're, there's still certain things we don't have control over. Have you watched the movie Dark Waters? Um, yeah. In anticipation of this, I just rewatched it last night again because I just wanted to bring up the emotions that I felt when I watched it the first time. And just the, the corruption within our own, you know, just those big corporations and it's just it's really disappointing that so little was done for the safety and these are really forever chemicals and they're so abundant one of the things i find shocking is that they're so abundant in female um, hygiene products so now you have someone who might have heavy periods from such chemicals and then they're using products that might make it worse because if your tampon or your pad or your menstrual underwear has those chemicals in them, then you're even more exposed to what's causing um, what's causing the, the heavy peating. So that's a vicious cycle there. Um, I believe there was some testing that was a New York Times article that just came out uh, two months ago, looking at feminine hygiene products, and most of them had traces of those fluoride-based or um, <laughs> carbon fluoride-based uh, chemicals. They said the the only thing they didn't, the only product they didn't find it was the silicone menstrual cups. There was like two that they tested and they didn't have that. So I think it's super important that those tests, you know, exist that you develop because um, someone is asking what testing do you use to check for toxins? Um, I mean, your test would be a great one for the chemicals, right? And then I do mold testing, I do Great Plains, and I do heavy metal testing uh, for either Vibrant Wellness or Doctor's Data. Um, but yeah, so I find the feminine the feminine hygiene product one it was so shocking to me when I learned about it. It's like we are making your issues worse. We should maybe consult. I feel like every gynecologist should know about it. I should be able to tell you you should only use non-bleached organic cotton of that brand or maybe prioritize menstrual cups if you can because they are not so chemical chemically toxic. Um, but yeah that was one thing I wanted to bring up today that is just like shocking that uh what we put our skin, our cosmetics, mm -hmm. our makeup, our feminine hygiene products could make some of our period issues worse. Stay tuned or working on it. So, you know, besides <laughs> human testing, how can we actually test the product to making sure that we're actually getting safe products? Oh, because okay. there's so many times we can't control our supply chain, for example, and then there's not really a verifying body to actually see, okay, 
you know, is our chocolate free of heavy metals? Is our period wear, you know, free of papers? Yeah. So I think that's important. I don't know if anybody has any other questions, but yeah, I think, I think those were the main points I wanted to make today that, you know, there's just so much more awareness to be, um, to, to be gained for people. And I love doing that with patients. I love being the one who, who, um, counsels them about it. Someone is asking, do you also test women's endometriosis? Yes, you could, doctor. Uh, is that doctor actually? Uh, yes, doc, you could, because endometriosis is definitely associated with, um, Estrogen mimicking uh, molecules can worsen that. We know that it's an immune suppressed state. We know that it has to do with, um, it's it's almost like an autoimmune condition and that the T cells are suppressed. So you kind of want to look at chemicals because that could be associated with worsening symptoms for people. Um, and we know that certain chemicals like DS, that like if the grandmother was exposed to that, the granddaughter can have higher risk of endometriosis. So I believe the presence of those chemicals and endocrine disruptors can make a big difference. Uh, and so cleaning up their environment, cleaning up their diet, not eating from, not warming up their Tupperware, like plastic Tupperware in a microwave and not eating from plastics, um, using, you know, the right cookware, using the right utensils for cooking and filtering the water. All those things are super important. And so I talk about that with my endometriosis patients. Totally on the same page. Thank you so much for sharing. I think we're going to have to invite you back to talk about other topics. Sure. I loved it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us today. Have a good day. Bye-bye, Don. You too. Bye. <laughs>